Welcome to War Room, the official podcast of the U.S. Army War College Online Journal, graciously supported by the Army War College Foundation. Please join the conversation at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. We hope you enjoy the program. You can subscribe to A Better Peace, the War Room podcast, at iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite download service, and never miss the great content we offer. Welcome to A Better Peace, the podcast of the War Room here at the U.S. Army War College. I'm Ron Granary, professor of history in the Department of National Security and Strategy at the Army War College and podcast editor for the War Room. Since 1978, the International Fellows Program at the Army War College has welcomed representatives of allied militaries to participate in the educational life of the college. International Fellows are full participants in seminars and bring a variety of experiences to enrich the conversations. Over the past four decades, over 1,750 International Fellows from more than 120 countries have participated in the program. Of that number, 68 have been elevated to the International Fellows Hall of Fame, an honor for those fellows who have achieved the highest rank in their nation's armed forces or who have held an equivalent rank or responsibility in a multinational organization. Our guest today is the 69th and most recent addition to the Hall of Fame, Major General Eric Christofferson, Chief of Staff of the Royal Norwegian Army, who graduated with distinction from the U.S. Army War College in 2015. Major General Christofferson assumed duty as the Chief of the Norwegian Army in August of 2019, after serving as the Chief for the Norwegian Home Guard. In 2008, he was presented with the Norwegian War Cross with Sword for Outstanding Leadership and Bravery during operations in Afghanistan, one of the few Norwegians to receive this decoration since World War II. A native of Bjerkvik, Norway, General Christofferson entered the Army in 1988 as a non-commissioned officer. After earning his commission in 1995, he joined the Special Forces Command in 1999 and has held many positions and commands with the Royal Norwegian Army over the past 20 years. We're delighted to have him with us today. Greetings to you, General Christofferson, and congratulations on your uh, uh, induction into the Hall of Fame. Thank you, Ron. It was uh, great to be to be back in at the U.S. Army War College, and it was an honor to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. I am curious what it's like to come back to Carlisle as a uh, as a as a grown up, as it were, after having been here as a student. You, in your remarks, you you made some very good uh, jokes about about being a student, some serious comments as well. Uh, what are your what are your what memories do you bring back with you to Carlisle? So I I have uh, only good memories from Carlisle mm-hmm. from from the learning process from what we the writing assignments from the readings, but uh, most of all maybe from the seminars and uh, and at least the social um, interaction with all the international students and the Americans. Mm-hmm. So as part of the soccer team and we we had a really uh, combined joint soccer team there with uh, all services and uh, all different nations playing together every Sunday with the kids. It was re- a really networking event, really. Mm-hmm. So we could um, actually get to know each other even better and uh, and uh, build a network that uh, I have even used since I graduated. And so your whole family came with you from Norway at the time? Yeah, I, I had my oldest daughter and uh, and my oldest stepdaughter. They were back in Norway because they were in in um, senior high school, but uh, the rest of the family was with me, yeah. And am I correct that you you liked Central Pennsylvania so much that your daughter is attending university here in the area? <laughs> yeah, my oldest daughter is now at uh, Penn State doing her last year in law school uh-huh. as an exchange student from Norway. I'm not sure if it was my experience <laughs> at the War College that uh, encouraged her, but uh, but uh, it was an exchange program with a university in Oslo, so, so she happened to be in Penn State. So I, I picked her up yesterday and drove, took her down to Carlisle, so she was... She was with me at the, at the induction today. That's a, that's a, a, a great additional uh, benefit of coming over to visit, I exactly. guess. Exactly. Um, I have to ask you, what, what struck me looking at your biography is that you, in this, uh, you initially enlisted in the Army and served as a non-commissioned officer before going to officer candidate school and now rising all the way to chief of staff. Um, I'm curious how unusual such a, uh, such a career path is in the Norwegian Army, and do you think that your previous experience as an enlisted man has... Uh, uh, shapes your approach as a general officer? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, most of the um, Norwegians at that time, they enlisted first. Mm-hmm. So they, they did their uh, national service mm-hmm. or conscription. And then uh, you could do something more out of it. You could take a leadership program and, and you could be a sergeant. And then you could join the, the military academy. And, and we still, most of the 
officers still do it that way in Norway. They start as a, as a conscript and they, they join the military academy. Um, I think what, what has really changed my, my perspective was the time in the special forces mm -hmm. when I, I went from a captain and a company commander and I had to give up my, my rank to become a lieutenant again to join the special forces. And I really learned to be a soldier again. And I was 30 years old, so, so I was told it was the end of my career because I gave up my rank and I moved into the special forces. But, but then uh, the world changed again. And, uh, and I think maybe that what I really learned is that you have to follow, first of all, what you want to do mm -hmm. and not all the advices you get from everybody else. So that, is, that is always the challenge, though, to have the bravery to do that, right? To yeah, I, it was a, someone said it was a career-ending moment um, to start there, but, but it changed my career due to a lot of, uh, of different uh, circumstances, most of all because of 9-11. Mm -hmm. So suddenly the special forces, we were back in, or we were in Afghanistan and we, and we found ourselves in the front line of, of the ongoing war. And what made you decide, what, what, was there anything in particular since you, if you joined the special forces before 9-11 or, or what made you decide to do it? The challenge, the excitement? It was definitely the, the challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I used to work with, um, with long range reconnaissance and patrols. Uh, I, I really liked soldiering. Um, I think I had... Uh, in retrospect, I felt that I had too little time as an enlisted mm -hmm. to really be, be a soldier. So I wanted to do the soldiering part of it again and be as good as a soldier I could be. So, um, so joining the Special Forces was, was uh, going through a tough selection process with people 10 years younger than me <laughs> and, uh, and going through the, the continuous training. And, uh, and I was a diver and I, I did parachuting and I did most insertion methods. So it was, um, I would say it was in many ways, the highlights of my career. I can imagine. To really be a, a, a good soldier again. And then uh, to then, after that, move on and, and take responsibility as a platoon commander, company commander, regimental commander, and later on uh, commanding at the two-star level. It's an astonishing uh, uh, career path. Very interesting. In your, in your remarks today, um, you referred to the lessons of Norway's experiences from 1940. And especially you made two comments that I hope you don't mind me quoting back at you. One of them was that small states need alliances, which I think is a very solid comment. But the other one is that allies are more than friends. You say Nor Norway had plenty of friends in 1940, but didn't have enough, didn't have enough allies. And all of which, you know, you, you argue uh, shapes Norway's feelings about its role in NATO and the, and the place of NATO. In your experience, how, how if at all has cooperation within NATO uh, developed over the course of your career, especially in recent years, is there anything? Is there anything the alliance could be doing that it's not doing, or anything that you think it should consider in the future? Uh, the alliance, NATO, just like um, like all uh, armies, I think in in Europe, uh, at the end of the Cold War, we were struggling to find out what what is the purpose of our our being. Mm -hmm. We started looking in out of area operations, as we call it in NATO. Uh, operations outside NATO's area of responsibility, uh, going to Afghanistan, uh, Iraq now, uh, Syria, um, the Balkans at the 90s, in the beginning of the 90s. So we, we started looking at that. Some, some nations started looking at the, the armed forces supported the police. Uh, some people started uh, decreasing their army mm -hmm. at a high speed. Um, so we, uh, we, had, uh, we were struggling with the purpose. And I think now with... Uh, the realizing that uh, that the war hasn't changed that much over the past uh, hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, there is still geopolitics. There is still a struggle between uh, big powers. And for small states, you have to to carefully direct your um, your strategy so it uh, it fits into the, the world mm -hmm. as it is and not the world uh, as we want it to be. So um, so if it, if you go back to NATO, what, what we have uh, really learned is, of course, interoperability. Mm -hmm. We learned the value of that during our, our operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, but we need to develop that even further mm -hmm. because there is still uh, too uh, much limitations on the interoperability between uh, different nations. And uh, we still don't have the right command structure to facilitate uh, a large combined joint operation. Mm -hmm. So we need to go back and think big, and we need to think uh, big fast. Well, I'm curious, because you did mention the, the importance of jointness, uh, interoperability. Uh, you mentioned these in your remarks, and I, I am curious about this, especially from a special forces perspective, right? Jointness matters a lot. You need to cooperate with others. Um, do you think the Norwegians 
uh, offer an example of jointness that that you could uh, that that could be shared with other allies? I think uh, Norway is starting to understand the importance of jointness. I don't think we are we are uh, fully there yet. Mm-hmm. I think the, the special forces community in Norway, because we were very few people, we always had to rely on on uh, helicopters, aircraft, uh, ships from the navy. So Air Force, Navy, Army, Home Guard, everybody played a role because we were so few people in the Special Forces. So we had actually, we were forced to work together. In operations overseas, we were forced, of course, to work together with, with all our allies. So we, we, we de- developed a culture where you don't say na- na- no to anything. You, <laughs> you take what you can get and you try to use it in the best way. So in that way, you can learn something. But I, th- I think we still have a way to go in Norway when it comes to, to real jointness. Mm-hmm. And then I'm talking about command and control systems mm-hmm. down to the lowest level. So we, every soldier out there should be able to call for fire. And we are not there yet. So we, we, can, we can take that uh, much farther than we have done so far. And when we come to, um, to NATO and, uh, and the different nations, there are still challenges with uh, national um, uh, restrictions on sharing of data, sharing of uh, crypto, and we need to work work across those barriers. I noticed that, ironically, you talk about international cooperation, that a student in my current seminar, Seminar 20, Yuris, is from Latvia and is a special yeah. operations. I noticed that that you two had worked together in, in soft yeah. operations in the, in the region. And uh, does uh, does Norway have uh, special uh, joint relationships with its fellow, with its neighbors, um, in addition to the broader alliance? Yeah, so, so uh, Norway has, uh, of course, uh, a very close relationship with the U.S. Mm-hmm. and the U.K., historically. Mm-hmm. Um, then the Army, Navy, and Air Force, they have quite some different partners, but, uh, but uh, U.S., U.K., the Netherlands, Germany, the Nordic countries, and the Baltic countries. Mm-hmm. That's sort of the main sphere of um, of uh, interests mm-hmm. for for cooperation so we do uh, we do a lot with um, with even sweden and finland which is, who are not part of nato mm-hmm. but then of course the baltic countries and uh, and uh, the, our closest neighbors and uh, speaking, in, well, speaking in Northern of Europe, close yeah. neighbors right you mentioned that uh, geopolitics can be permanent even as political attitudes can change um, no matter what happens norway will also uh, happen to be right next door to russia Hmm. And you mentioned uh, earlier uh, the the issue that climate change and other changes are are going to make the relationship with Russia on the northern flank of NATO even that much more important. Um, how does Norway manage its relationship with Russia, uh, both sort of within within NATO, but also as a uh, as a day to day operation of the, being right next door? So so it it was very close after mm-hmm. the Cold War. We, we try to work uh, with Russia as, as and NATO even stated Russia as a partner mm-hmm. during the the two, beginning of the 2000 even up until 2010. Mm-hmm. Russia was considered to be a possible partner in the future. Uh, after Crimea, this all changed. So, so with the, the Russian uh, will to use force uh, on neighboring countries, um, it uh, sort of changed the dynamics, and uh, also they increased. Um, uh, tempo of exercises we see in our close area without warnings often uh, is also an example on on uh, on the ho- why we are more concerned now mm-hmm. about Russia as a neighbor than we used to be. At the same time, we are we are trying to have as much dialogue as possible. So on Friday, the 25th of October, I will go to Kirkenes, close to the Russian border, and and even uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov from Russia will be there, celebrating that 75 years ago, Russia liberated. Uh, uh, the northern part of Norway from from Nazi Germany. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you so you try to balance that between deterrence, where NATO plays a a big role in it, of course, and our close relationship uh, across the Atlantic. At the same time, have as much dialogue as possible, without uh, without uh, losing our values. Mm-hmm. So when when they when the Russia invaded uh, Ukraine, it was it was definitely. Uh, crossing a red line, mm-hmm. so uh, so we are still working with those um, issues after that uh, that that happened. So I, I would say, how do we do? What do we do to to um, try to to show Russia that we are not an immediate threat? Mm-hmm. The way we do it is that we try to have as much Norwegian presence uh, close to the border as possible. So we try to keep NATO and Allied exercises mm-hmm. a little bit away from the border. So that what Russia sees is 
Norwegian soldiers, Norwegian ships, Norwegian aircraft. Even if they know that they are part of NATO, right. we have Norwegians there on the border and uh, close to the border. So that emphasizes good neighborly relations, bilateral. It, yeah, relations. it emphasizes uh, that we respect each other. Mm-hmm. It emphasizes that uh, if a mistake happen, it's Norway that has done it, not some allies. Uh, so it's our responsibility. And Norway is, is, of course, a very legitimate partner in there because we have we share the border, we share the the um, the border in in the in the ocean, mm-hmm. and we have a mutual interest in uh, both fisheries, oil, uh, minerals. So we need to to take care of that very harsh environment in a very good way. Right, and and when we talk about the the gradual opening of the Northwest Passage, right, and the gradual. Uh, uh, the, the greater access along that northern coast has uh, have are we already seeing changes in activity and the relationship in that Arctic region? Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. The the Arctic is changing rapidly, mm-hmm. uh, more rapidly than than we 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 thought. So so it opens up new possibilities. Um, it opens up areas for um, for uh, searching for oil and minerals that were considered. Unaccessible unaccess- uh, some years ago, it opens up uh, new routes of um, sea routes of uh, of communications. So, um, so I think uh, the environment is changing more rapidly than we we expected it, it to do. But also, it opens up a lot of possibilities. So, meaning that uh, the whole region will be more interesting, both in regards of uh, of commercial activities, but uh, but also in regards of, of security policy. So that's why I said geopolitics haven't changed the last years, really. Mm-hmm. Because when you start looking at, um, at where Russia keeps their, their nuclear capabilities, they keep it there close to, to Norway. And I think for several reasons. One is, of course, the access to the, to the, to the oceans. Uh, the other thing is that they have a good relationship with their neighbor. Mm-hmm. So, and the third is, of course, the distance from, uh, from, uh, from Russia to, to the US. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, from geopolitics, I want to ask you a question about about management of the armed forces uh, you know, in your current position, but also uh, in your previous position. Right, you were instrumental in bringing women into the Norwegian special forces, so much so that, as you showed us in a photo during or shown us in a photo during your introduction today, the current commander of the Norwegian Home Guard is a woman. Uh, and I am curious, how did you and your colleagues manage the? social political transition within the armed forces to uh, encourage uh, the rise of, uh, to, to encourage the integration of women into the forces and their, their uh, prominent roles in leadership positions. Yeah, the, the biggest challenge is, um, is uh, not the young people. The biggest mm-hmm. challenge is, is the experienced soldiers and, and officers who have been in for, let's say, 15, 20 years because they have seen, uh, they have seen a lot of of um, difficulties with bringing in women previously. Sure. When you when you when you look at the the, the young, the young soldiers, the 20, 21, 22, they don't think the same way because mm-hmm. they're used to it. Mm-hmm. So you can change it rapidly, but you have to increase the number of female mm-hmm. in what I would call a critical minimum. Mm-hmm. So it actually becomes part of of the unit, but still they are still females. Mm-hmm. I think one of the mistakes we did in the beginning was that we we um, we tried to get in one or two females so we could have some females, but they were measured and and treated and everything was the culture didn't change right. because it was still a male culture. They became part of that culture right. instead of bringing in a different perspective. So uh, so one of the challenges was what do we mean by standards? Mm-hmm. Because I didn't want to lower the physical standards. Sure. So I, I we had a very thorough. Um, read back on on what is that what is the minimum standards and once we agreed on the minimum standards, we didn't go below those. Mm-hmm. The problem was that when you selected people, you didn't stop at the minimum standards. If it very easy example, if it was five pull ups, mm-hmm. you you need to stop at five mm-hmm. <laughs> because you don't need to measure the guy who takes six or seven or eight or ten because you already said that five is as enough. Long, as long as you make five, five is enough. Yeah, mm-hmm. but we, we don't do that. We we ah. we, we keep you know, pushing people, right? And then suddenly you start measuring things that you can measure, and not the important things that is very hard to measure. Oh. So, um, so uh, standards, being agreeing on minimum standards and not uh, going under those, 
is uh, very important because then you can start looking for the other um, other um, things you need as a as a special forces operator or as a, or as a soldier. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, I, I would argue that most of the minimum standards we have set in the special forces is is uh, very achievable for most females. And mm -hmm. I tested it out on on mothers and mm -hmm. and uh, other officers, uh, female officers. And if with a half year preparation, could you meet the minimum standards? Yeah, they could. Mm -hmm. But um, but then we start selecting people and we select them maybe a little bit wrong. And so now is are both men and women conscripted in yeah. the armed forces? So Norway mm -hmm. Norway had. Um, had uh, so they have conscriptions for everybody, mm -hmm. both men and female, from uh, I think the from people born in 1998 or or later. All right. Meaning that you we don't have a recruitment problem mm -hmm. because you can call in whoever you want. Right. In reality, only 12 percent of the population does their conscription, and it's so popular, so that it's 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 almost volunteer now. It's it, it's mm -hmm. basically volunteer. Because they can, can they choose alternate service, or they're not necessarily called up because you don't need that. No, we only we only call in twelve because they are not. We don't twelve percent because we don't. So the the eighty eight percent that mm -hmm. are not called upon, they they don't do anything. They don't do anything. No. Yeah. So that's a, and that's a discussion um, now. Is should we increase the number of conscripts? Um, and I, I don't see any problem with it because we have a mixture of conscripts. They do one year of of their. Um, National service as a conscript first, and then they have seven months left to do um, um, training mm -hmm. until they are 44 years old, and then they are done. Yeah. And right now, it's so popular that that there is there is, uh, like I said, it's it's a volunteer force based on conscription. Based on conscription, yeah. which you know, NATO is an interesting mix of states that have conscription and states that don't. Mm. Do the military leaders of of NATO armed forces uh, ever? compare notes on issues of of uh, recruitment of uh, talent management retention or is, is this something it's everybody deals with it on their own no it's it's a it's a it's a, there's a lot of talks between mm -hmm. uh, nations on how to how to solve this um these issues mm -hmm. like how do you keep people longer than uh, than uh, what is happening today how do you recruit the right ones mm -hmm. uh, should you go for conscriptions or not um it, the, the, the discussion goes back and forth. Sweden left conscription as mm -hmm. a as a system, and they went back to it. Um, we see conscription as uh, vital for uh, for a small nation. Mm -hmm. I need I need a large reserve in my army, and uh, with so few people in Norway, just about five about five million, I need conscription as my as my uh, platform to build the army. And uh, but I need more to complete their first 12 months so I can build a larger reserve structure sure. because we need people uh, out in in civilian work in Norway because there's too few people and too much to do. <laughs> do, yeah. you, do you find that that the uh, military in general in Norwegian society is is integrated and in Norwegian society and appreciated by the broader society? Yeah, it's society? very much it's very much appreciated. So mm -hmm. so conscription conscription in its uh, most basic way you know, it 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 gives us that close mm -hmm. Um That's a very good war college. Response. Sort of, sort of, uh, yeah, sort of uh, connection between the state, the people, and the army. Mm -hmm. So when the people are part of the army as conscripts, you know, it's it's very easy to uh, to have that uh, fulfilled. So, so, uh, but I see in the, in the U.S., you know, there's no clear connection between conscription and the support for the armed forces because mm -hmm. the support for the armed forces in the U.S. is uh, tremendous and very good mm -hmm. and. Um, and uh, but I see the same support in Norway as well. It's, um, it's people are very happy and have a great trust in our soldiers. And uh, when you when you measure it in uh, among the population in Norway, it's like more than eighty percent say that they believe in a Norwegian soldier. That's very good. Yeah. So when you uh, you know, reflecting on where you are now, is there any piece of advice that you would give to uh, Lieutenant Christofferson? Uh, or, or even, you know, Captain Christofferson, or when you were first, uh, when you were first given your, your first smaller commands, that that you now know that you wish you knew then. I think uh, what is the best advice to give young officers is to focus on what you can do, mm -hmm. and not on what you can't do. Uh, that was driving my my um, my uh, motivation to when I was a young officer, was you know all the all the possibilities I had to make my platoon make my um, squad, make my company as good as possible without being 
too much interested in the, the levels above. Mm-hmm. I, I, re- I really enjoyed the time. Maybe that's why I went back to be a soldier again, a special forces operator. Mm-hmm. Because I, I really missed that, 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 that time when I was only engaged in, in the, the real soldiering stuff. And, uh, and I, I left, I trusted my superiors enough, mm-hmm. so I didn't sort of pay much too, uh, too much attention to that. Maybe I should, in <laughs> retrospect, maybe I should have been a little bit more aware of, of the strategic environment. Mm-hmm. But uh, at the same time, I was occupied with, uh, with my first family and, and uh, loving my, my job. Of so so uh, now I enjoy the time and, and you do the most out of the resources you have and uh, deliver good results. And, and if there's something in the retrospect that I, I, I've always been proud of is, is that people who have worked for me, they have uh, in general uh, told me later on that they really enjoyed it because I spent time with the people. People matters. People matter. Uh, well, uh, I have one last question for you, and because that, that's an interesting issue about dealing with, with subordinates. Is there a strategic leader, past or present, either Norwegian or otherwise, that you consider to be a particularly good role model? <laughs> there, are, there are so many good role <laughs> models. So I, I mentioned George Marshall in my speech. Yes. You know, when, you, when I read his biography, um, he, you know, he, he knew the difference between politics and, and uh, military decisions. He knew, he knew the interaction between that. He knew how to raise an army and, and, uh, and uh, what, what, what was needed of him. He gave up, I think he gave up a lot of personal um, ambitions, like leading the, the invasion in Normandy True. to be back in, in Washington and, and do what was needed. So, uh, so he's uh, one of the, those. And then, then I met so many great generals uh, talking about America. Uh, General uh, Joe Wotel, mm-hmm. General Admiral Bill McRaven, General Mattis, generals I had the chance to interact with in Afghanistan and, uh, and uh, in Europe and in the US. You know, they, they see the whole specter from the frequencies on your communications equipment <laughs> to the strategic environment they're operating in. And they, they, they all value uh, time with people. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I've been grateful and lucky enough to, to have a conversation with, with, um, with those um, warfighters throughout the years from a young lieutenant up t- until uh, a colonel. And it's really impressive how they manage their time and you really feel their presence when you're in the room with them and they, they, they're interested. Yeah. Well, General, thank you very much for taking the time and presenting such an interesting story to us, uh, to the listeners of A Better Peace. Thank you for your service to your country and also to the West and uh, congratulations on your induction into the Hall of Fame. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for listening to this episode of A Better Peace. Uh, I hope that you will let us know what you think of this program and uh, we'll tune in next time. Until next time, for A Better Peace and for The War Room, I'm Ron Granary. Thanks for joining us. And that concludes our program. Thank you for listening. The views expressed in this podcast reflect those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views, policies, or positions of the U.S. Army or the Department of Defense. Let us know what you think. Provide us your feedback, comments, or suggestions through our webpage at warroom.armywarcollege.edu. And have a great day.